It's about being able to be a citizen if you follow a government mandate, which is encoded digitally into your smartphone and you will have to provide a QR code to prove. And then they can tack on any other mandate while digital currency comes into effect through central banks and you have no capacity to make a financial transaction without it being monitored and it could potentially be shut off. Max Blumenthal, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you very much for being on. I've been a big fan of yours for a while, and uh, it's been a goal of mine to, to have you on the show, so I really do appreciate your time. And uh, I think I actually started getting familiar with your work when uh, you launched Moderate Rebels, and uh, I was a big fan of, of that podcast, and uh, since that time, you've launched uh, The Gray Zone. I think that some folks are still a little confused about the uh, possibly the difference between them. Could you just... Uh, talk about these two different projects a little bit and uh, how Moderate Rebels led to the Gray Zone? That's a great question. I mean, I actually think the Gray Zone led to Moderate Rebels, but it's just been me working with Ben Norton uh, since we really formally started working together in 2017 when the Gray Zone was still a project at Alternet. Um, and we, I think that was the year that we launched Moderate Rebels as well. So Moderate Rebels was just a YouTube podcast. We were at Alternet and then, you know, I went solo after, or, or, or we took the gray zone into an independent realm after Alternet pretty much collapsed and then was sold to this Democratic Party click farm called Raw Story. So me and Ben have just been working together ever since then. And we brought Aaron Mate and Anya Parampil onto the gray zone as full-time contributors. So a lot of times uh, when you watch a Moderate Rebels live stream, it'll be streaming both at our Moderate Rebels channel on YouTube where we originally launched and at our Gray Zone YouTube channel. And then afterwards, we'll clip out a lot of highlights for the Moderate Rebels channel as well. Mm. So how much censorship has Gray Zone experienced over the last couple of years? Not as we have not experienced as much censorship as people who are now talking about COVID-19 and the new normal. This is a, a an increasingly new, hard, unprecedented layer of censorship. And we haven't really uh, made that a focus. But one thing that I noticed, actually, Ben Norton ran kind of an analysis of our algorithm on YouTube, was that in March 2020, when the pandemic was declared, all of a sudden our traffic experienced a major drop off at YouTube. It was obviously a result of a change in the algorithm targeting independent and al alternative media. So, I mean, you just look at that. If, if you looked at the chart before, our subscriber list was just constantly going up rapidly. We racked up about 100,000 new subscribers in just the first 10 months or so that we officially launched as a team on YouTube, a gray zone YouTube channel. And then it, when the pandemic was declared, it just flatlined. And since then we've only picked up in the course of the last two years or so, uh, about, I don't know, 50,000 or less subscribers, which doesn't make sense because you would think that it'd be a snowball effect. So I think when you talk about censorship, what you're talking about is algorithms and how they're adjusted uh, I've noticed that you know certain videos I used to watch on YouTube are no, it's no longer possible to find them. You get directed from a, you know, if I was going to watch Primo Radical on YouTube, I could possibly be redirected to something like Rising on the Hill or a Bill Maher discussion right after watching it. And I really feel like that is intentional. So there's so many different means of censorship that uh, require a lot of analysis to understand. And we recently saw Elizabeth Warren, uh, big censorship Bailey Warren, and Russiagate Inquisitor Adam Schiff, who was pushing a lot of hard censorship mechanisms uh, during the Russiagate era, call for Amazon to actually censor books that challenge the prevalent narrative around COVID-19. 
so they're actually calling for Amazon to censor books and they, they, they explicitly said change the algorithm. So I think that applies to anti-imperialists too. The algorithm has been changed for us to kind of, without us being able to complain and howl that we're being banned and censored, uh, we, it, it's harder to find the gray zone if, if you're just kind of browsing around YouTube looking for uh, a certain kind of content that might be critical of US foreign policy, for example. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to explain to folks who don't have their own channel um, or don't directly experience this, like the different kinds of censorship that that someone can go through. So it's not just being deplatformed. There's also being demonetized, which my channel was for about 10 months straight. It was completely demonetized. Us, us too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did, uh, did they give you a reason or anything? Never. We never get a reason. And, and when we protest... Uh certain videos will be re-monetized, but you have to go through the right. big tech bureaucracy to actually do that. And a lot of people don't have the time or energy. And then, I mean, also, as you mentioned, they just hide things. Like I've, I've searched uh, YouTube before, like for the title of my video, like in quotes, the title of my video, and it won't come up. Yeah. Well, Google does that as well. And we had an issue with Google for about a year where we would do the same thing. We would search the headlines, even in quotes of our articles, and they literally wouldn't come up. And one time we were in, we were in Honduras. So we had, there was a different algorithm there. So we would search for our articles in the same fashion and then use a VPN to get us on a uh, US IP and do a side-by-side -side comparison. And in Honduras, our articles would be the first thing that would come up, even if you would just search the subject matter, because we cover a lot of topics that uh, much of the media doesn't even cover. So it was obvious there was a US algorithm put into place to blacklist us and apparently you, and I mean, the list is growing. Yeah, and I've also noticed too that they um, seem to kind of stop you when you start taking off. So I've had a diff couple different periods where like views or subscribers will just like start skyrocketing because of some videos. And then like all of a sudden, like the channel just like gets killed and there's no new views. Like it just, it, the, the algorithm like stops suggesting videos in the channel for a while, I guess, just to kind of like flatline it. Yeah. Uh, we, we've, we've all experienced the same thing and, you know, there's so many different ways that censorship can be deployed without us being able to formally call it censorship. So I think we probably need a different language to understand what's mm -hmm. taking place. And I mean, I, I just knew at the beginning of the Russiagate era that this was going to be some uh, a problem that we would all face. Alternative content creators, alternative media, independent journalists, especially those who are critical of the, 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 the official narratives around, you know, anything from the dirty war on Syria to the new cold war with China. Uh, to, you know, police brutality in the U.S., that uh, we would be f put on lists conceived by think tanks like the Atlantic Council, which is, a, it's NATO's unofficial think tank in Washington. They have a digital forensics lab that has been brought in by Facebook, by Twitter, as kind of a consultant to determine who should be sort of soft censored, shadow banned, and who should be amplified. And so basically, Big tech is the state, big tech is US intelligence, but we can't claim that our free speech rights are being violated because we're not operating technically in the public sphere. And it's the perfect mechanism for the national security state to employ. Uh, they have, you know, they, 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 can, they can have their censorship and deny it too. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's kind of ridiculous also when you see conservatives or libertarians, even as they're being uh, attacked and uh, deplatformed and shadow banned, they will still say, well, they're, they're private institutions, so they can do whatever they want. But they're not really private institutions per se. It's, as you mentioned, it's uh, NATO kind of informing these decisions. It's the state and big tech kind of working together. I mean, in a, in a similar fashion too, to um, you know, what we're seeing with the, the vaccination mandates, it's a cooperation between big business and big government. Definitely. And it does raise certain questions. I mean, I'll leave out the, the public health issue, but 
it does raise certain questions about public regulation when the public, which is the national security state that's completely opaque and unaccountable to us, but which we pay for with our own tax dollars, is effectively already regulating big tech through these, for example, censorship mechanisms. Uh, what do we mean when we call for public regulation of Facebook, Twitter, uh, what AOC was clamoring for during a congressional hearing when she was dressing down Mark Zuckerberg, it really did sound like she was calling for more censorship. So what does this look like if we start treating these new di digital commons, which are technically privately controlled as uh, public utility like the phone company? Would it mean actually more censorship? I mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a problem when you, know, you argue with a libertarian. And, and then libertarians offer the same kind of argument about public health care when they say, look at how tyrannical the uh, public health officials are behaving right now. Fauci, Walensky, they're lying. They're, they're, they're openly bragging about telling noble lies to the public. They are complete failures and you want to invest them with new powers to control everything. Uh, I think, you know, there needs to be a better argument from our side. Well, Max, there's a lot of different topics that I wanted to go over today. Yeah. Um, and one of them in particular was, uh, you know, during the whole uh, TYT, Jimmy Dore, Aaron Maté yeah. feud, I was kind of uh, surprised when you kind of randomly got thrown into that um, in, in Cenk Uger's tweet where he listed you with Aaron yeah, Jimmy yeah. And, and Glenn Greenwald. Were you also surprised when he kind of just lumped you in with them to, to kind of attack or I don't know if maybe you had any kind of experience with, with Jenk prior to that? Well, I, I've known Jenk for like almost 20 years now. I mean, I can't say I've kept up with him and we've been great buddies, but I, I knew him and now I wasn't surprised at all, but really wh wh why I wasn't surprised was that I'm identified with uh, challenging Russia gate. One of, I was one of the first people I think in the, left to challenge it in a very uh, kind of forensic way through investigative journalism and, you know, going on as, as many media outlets as I could from Jimmy Dore to even Tucker Carlson to warn about the dangers of Russiagate, that this wasn't really just about getting Trump or embarrassing Trump, that there was a convergence between the Clintonite dead enders and the national security state and that the national security state's interests were what we on the left should be concerned about. So then I was called the Kremlin shill and Putin puppet. I mean, I was actually called a Putin puppet back in 2014 in the New York Times in an op-ed by some um, Polish neoliberal because I had said that I was one of the few journalists in so-called progressive media reporting on the proliferation of neo-Nazism within the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military, which is now accepted. It's just so obvious that they're overrun with neo-Nazism, that it's the world capital of neo-Nazism. And it's effectively a NATO state, even though technically it's not. So that, that wasn't, I mean, it was like, Cenk was just saying something that a million other uh, kind of liberal imperialists have said about me. And it, I guess my reaction was more jaded than Aaron's. Aaron was really, genuinely outraged i mean i i've just been I, and I'm, I'm i mean he he definitely should have been outraged it was righteous indignation what jank and anna kasparian said about him was you know it was classic mccarthyism so i'm glad he took that on but for me it had just been like years and years of that and what jank was kind of demanding is that i in order to prove that i'm not a kremlin shill i denounce putin and like, why do I need to get in his good graces? Do you think as uh, the Democratic Party, which is now in control, uh, as they become more authoritarian and start, you know, um, implementing like the, the COVID measures, for example, um, but other policies as well, do you think that this uh, division, which I think it's already pretty clear, but do you think it'll become more clear between these imperialist grifters, honestly, who sort of simp for the DNC versus, you know, anti-imperialist, genuine uh, journalists like yourself. Do you think that that division will become more clear to, um, you know, most leftists who may not have previously kind of perceived that division? 
you know, you, you raise a really, a, an area of serious concern to me. Uh, and I don't actually have a good answer for you because this is one of the few times where I've seen rifts develop that, of course, continue to separate those of us who identify with the left who are completely separated from the Democratic Party or see the Democratic Party as a vehicle of Wall Street in the war state. And of course, they're, of course they're on the other side, but the, the, the COVID narrative has really divided everybody, including within the left. There are fractures that hadn't existed before, uh, really since the coercive policies came in. And I, don't, I, I wonder what, what you think, I mean, if you have an answer to that question and what you think overall about what this, what these policies and the overall narrative, I mean, it's obvious now there is a narrative, there is official propaganda being filtered into the, you know, there's, there's, there's fear porn, there's coercive media, there's an information war, it should be obvious. Uh, but a lot of people on the left, many people I respect are self-censoring or they're not sure that they completely oppose it. So I wonder where you are on this issue. Yeah, I think you kind of anticipated my, my next question. So again, I think that the uh, the rift that we saw earlier this summer really highlighted the difference between you know the uh, people who are enthusiastic about the Democratic Party or um, you know may hide that and try to hide that enthusiasm, but supportive of the Democratic Party and uh, you know who sort of backed Russia Gate um, or maybe like just ambivalently or, or supportive of the DNC. But yeah, I see where you're saying where there are people who question question Russiagate, anti-imperialist yeah. folks now who seem to be uh, pushing back against uh, quote unquote anti-vaxxers or against like ivermectin, for example. Yeah, um, you know, I I honestly haven't really talked to too many of those folks um, over the last couple months. Like I, I haven't talked to Aaron Mate or uh, Katie Halper or some of these folks who who seem to be, you know, um, strongly against uh you know anti-vaxxers and whatnot um i'd love to kind of get their perspective but I, I know one thing that aaron mentioned in particular is that he talked about vaccinations in the third world and that he thought that they weren't getting enough vaccines so that was indicative of the fact that um you know it's not this sort of conspiracy because we're, we're not giving it to people who would need it um again i'd, I'd love to kind of discuss it with him but i i agree that i think it is sort of a danger now where these folks who have been consistently anti-imperialist may be getting divided themselves because of COVID. Yeah, well, I think it's exposed a lot of contradictions within the anti-imperialist left. And also there's an element of fear about being censored out of existence, which is, I guess, legitimate. But for me as a journalist, I went into the profession thinking that, you know, in the end, you might wind up being very lonely by doing the kind of journalism that's necessary. And you can constantly offend people, including people around you, by telling the truth. So I'm trying to approach this journalistically instead of as an influencer or someone who's built up an audience that I need to maintain and cater to in order to maintain a, a living or, or uh, my platform. And for me, it became really, I, I, I mean, I was mostly clammed up, even though I, knew, I don't trust the government. I don't trust the U.S. government. I mean, that's, that's kind of my baseline impulse. And so I was suspicious about the, what was taking place throughout the pandemic, throughout 2020, uh, particularly with the lockdowns. It just made very little sense to me, but I clammed up. And then once the vaccines came into mass production and it was clear that they were very leaky, what I always suspected they would be like, they don't prevent transmission. So it's an individual choice to maybe prevent severe illness or death if you wanna take one, but it's not actually uh, technically pr protecting others. That's something Fauci and CDC director Rochelle Walensky have both admitted to in the, during the Delta variant, but I think which was, was always true. And at the same time, they're being pushed on the population in such coercive ways that the entire swath of the US population and the global population that is resistant to taking them is being demonized 
in much the same fashion that the Russians were demonized under during the Trump era or the quote unquote terrorists and Muslim Americans were demonized during the Bush era. So I kind of just had all of, all of the trigger points go off and I decided it was time to start kind of raising questions about where we were going because it's obvious we're going to a place of a kind of digital capitalist authoritarianism. Uh, I, every socialist, I think, should be concerned when a capitalist order is going to impose digital vaccine passports as a ticket to society. And you see so much gaslighting on Twitter, including by leftists who say, oh, these are just like the um, vaccines we had to take when we wanted to go to school. And it's just like having a library card. Richard Wolf, who you've hosted on your program, uh, I guess his penetrating insights on the economy don't translate well into the pandemic because he likened vaccine passports and mandates to, uh, yeah, having a driver's license. And really, it's about being able to be a citizen if you follow a government mandate, which is encoded digitally into your smartphone, and you will have to provide a QR code to prove. And then they can tack on any other mandate while digital currency comes into effect through central banks and you have no capacity to make a financial transaction without it being monitored and it could potentially be shut off. So this is a new reality that's very disturbing to me. It amounts to a social credit system. A lot of the policies that are coming into effect are policies that the liberal democratic West always mocked and derided quote unquote totalitarian states, uh, socialist states, which are under siege from the empire for doing. For example, Australia now requires citizens to get permission to leave. Um, and they're putting returning travelers into quarantine, quarantine centers. Uh, those who don't quarantine have to sign up for a facial recognition app and report their location and submit to random tests. If they don't provide their location within 15 minutes, police show up at their door. Uh, these, you know, along with the social credit system are what, you know, Americans and American exceptionalists always attack the Soviet Union and China for doing. But unlike the Soviet Union and China, the US and Australia, they don't really live under siege from more powerful military and economic forces. So what's the justification here? What is the public health benefit? To me, it seems like control and an effort to suppress resistance to the preservation of global capitalism. Um, you know, we can talk about that more in detail, but, you know, back to censorship and where, well, I, I guess back, back to your point about um, the global South and getting vaccines to the global South and this whole concept of vaccine apartheid. You don't see a lot of the people howling about vaccine apartheid talking about segregationist measures in the countries they live in that are coming into effect. They seem to be standing by silently or supporting them. And at the same time, you know, in some sectors of the left, there's this concept of listening to the voices of the subaltern and people in other countries. Well, we have this huge controversy exploding right now with Nicki Minaj. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of her music, like some of her early verses were pretty good, but then when she went pop, I thought it was really trashy and never gave her that much credit. But, you know, now she is articulating the feelings of a lot of people in the global South about an exported or imposed biomedical despotism that they're deeply uncomfortable with. And she's defending herself in a pretty effective way and also kind of exploding the bipartisan uh, division over COVID, the culture war. And she has been called apparently by the White House and told to step down. I mean, it all started with her talking about people in Trinidad and Tobago, she's, Tobago she's related to who are having adverse effects. And they didn't sound like any adverse effects I've ever heard of, but that's, what, that's how a lot of people in the global South feel about this. And you're not supposed to say that. Um, you're not supposed to talk about polls in Kenya, for example, or other parts 
of West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa that show that less than 10% of people are eager to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, Senegal, countries like this, where a vast majority of people say that they do not consider it a major disruption to their lives. You are not supposed to share a New York Times article, which was very condescending, but shows poll numbers from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip of Palestinians who say in large numbers, like over 80%, that they do not want to take a COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, and there are Palestinians making very cogent arguments about wanting to wait to see that it's tested uh, over the course of three to five years as other vaccines previously have. Couldn't we understand why they do not want another Western aid package coming straight from USAID injected into their arms? Seems actually pretty rational, but the New York Times reporter says they're victims of disinformation. Uh, we recently have seen in the past week protests in Tehran that were completely uncovered, not covered by Western media against vaccine mandates there. And uh, people I've corresponded with in Iran say that the majority, the bare majority of those protesting are in the religious or revolutionary camp. That you've seen thousands of people protest in Turkey. This isn't just a Western phenomenon. And people who say that, you know, the real problem here is the failure to get them vaccines. Well, I'm, I'm, I have no problem, like personally, I wouldn't have any problem with getting access to vaccines that have shown that they can reduce the severity of illness. And I know people who want them, but they're not actually looking at the reality or recognizing that there is another, lay, there's an, there is an ulterior agenda here. It's not just about public health. And we can see in certain states in Nigeria, for example, that people are being cut off from their ability to go to the bank unless they submit to vaccine mandates. Uh, where is this coming from? I mean, from their perspective, it's coming from the West, these policies. It doesn't feel authentic. Uh, you have a large part of the population that exists in the informal economic sector, doesn't, that can't, that, that will not survive lockdowns and that can't abide by a lot of these mandates. What will happen to them? Um, I think these are things that need to be considered. And I think this is what is so unsettling about what Nicki Minaj said. It's why the White House is trying to co-opt her. She right now is far more threatening and unsettling to the centers of power in the US than anything said or worn by the second most famous self-styled socialist, AOC. Yeah, I uh, I totally agree. Um, I I really didn't have Nicki Minaj on my radar at all. I, I'm not really a fan of her music either, to to be candid. But uh, yeah, I I was quite surprised uh, how outspoken she was, and um, just thought that was amazing. You know that the you know capitalism builds up these uh, these celebrities, and then if you have one start speaking genuinely or going off script, that can really uh, jeopardize the narratives. So, you know, I, yeah. I was. I was emboldened by that. Uh, I thought that was that was pretty awesome. But you, know, you have to wonder. I mean, this, this is, is she... where we are. This is where we are in the U.S. right now, where it's just random, random people coming out and speaking out and threatening power. It's not who we typically expect, and those who we would expect to challenge power, who define themselves as socialists, are fully invested in the contemporary system and trusting the experts and so on. So. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of Bernie or AOC. Right. Uh, and then you have Tulsi Gabbard basically fully embodying the, the harshest critique of herself after she did at one point actually threaten the national security state. Yeah. And again, I, I think that's really the only kind of hope to push back on, uh, you know, on these initiatives really is uh, celebrities, because even like from a political perspective, you know, it's, it's fallen into a really kind of partisan divide where it's this battle between these kind of Trump supporting governors like DeSantis and uh, the federal yeah. government. Yeah, I think, you know, it's got to be coming from people like Nicki Minaj and Joe Rogan, who are kind of raising concerns among average people outside of traditional left right politics. Yeah, uh, a quick comment on Joe Rogan. Uh, he got COVID. He was demonized because he's raised questions about the new normal, about the official narrative. 
the same way, you know, those of us who've raised questions about official narratives on, uh, you know, foreign policy or you know, dirty wars in the Middle East have, have been demonized, but in a much um, darker way. Uh, you could sense in the demonization there was a hope that he would actually die for questioning questioning the, the, the what, what what's they, they openly the that, and that's that's yeah. one of the you know just most eye-opening things too is the fact that you have all these liberals online cheering when anti-vaxxers die or mocking it it's it's really sickening yeah and uh it's encouraged at, at the highest level i mean you can see the cdc's hand in pushing this kind of fear mongering it, it encourages self-censorship too if you're a public figure and you want to speak out, just keep in mind, if you get COVID, everyone's going to be cheering for your death. And if you somehow die of it, well, then people will celebrate your death. But what actually happened with Joe Rogan was that he came out and boasted about taking early treatments. He recovered in two days. He took, he did what you're, what, what you're supposed to do, what people who are fully vaccinated who get breakthrough cases, which is happening more and more, should be doing to stay out of the hospital, which is to go get uh, monoclonal antibody treatments. Like if you're watching this, I, I, I don't give medical advice, but you know, uh, many people that I know and uh, doctors I've spoken to who prescribe early treatments have had great success with monoclonal antibodies. I don't know if they even have any side effects and they're, you, you just go to a local clinic. Uh, there's a, a national network where you can just put in your zip code and find out about a clinic to get monoclonals. And Rogan, then he said the, you know, the, he, 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 he used the I word, ivermectin, for some reason that inspires so much anger and hatred. And he said that he took ivermectin in combination with monoclonals and lots of vitamins and he recovered. Um, you know, and obviously he doesn't have comorbidities. There are a lot of people who do have comorbidities uh, who might actually, they, they can't do what Joe Rogan did. And that's, who's, that's who vaccinations are for. But the point is, another prominent athlete around the same age as Joe Rogan, who has, is known as, who's still a, a, a professional athlete at age 47, uh, one of the best conditioned boxers in recent history, the golden boy, Oscar De La Hoya, got a breakthrough case and said that he was fully vaccinated. And he tweeted from the hospital that COVID had kicked his ass. I don't know if he took any early treatments or what they gave him, but you didn't see the same kind of cheering and gloating over De La Hoya. In fact, if you read about him having to cancel his fight and possibly cancel his career, which was going to be this big nationally televised uh, like pseudo fight, um, the art, you have to read to like paragraph 18 in the article to even see that he's fully vaccinated. Whereas the headlines about Rogan were all about him taking ivermectin and being this uh, lunatic anti-vaxxer. Um, and of course the outcome isn't really that the recovery of Joe Rogan isn't. Yeah. Really right. They don't even it. talk about that. He's taking horse to wormer. It's like, well, he's not taking horse to wormer, but what happened when he take, when he took ivermectin? I mean, this speaks to the whole, denigration of science by the science, you know, with a trademark on the end, because ivermectin is one of the most inspiring drugs in history. It was given, it was it received or its pioneers, uh, William, Dr. William C. Campbell and Dr. Satoshi Omura received a Nobel Prize in 2018 for pioneering this drug using microorganisms, just pure simplicity. They basically drew on natural organisms to make a drug that wiped out river blindness and elephantite and elephantitis two of the most debilitating drugs that were uh, uh, diseases that were harming millions of people in the poorest regions who were the most vulnerable please join me in welcoming dr campbell who will present his nobel lecture under the title ivermectin a reflection on simplicity So at that time, we had information suggesting that ivermectin might be useful in humans against a variety of parasitic worms, including hookworm, for example. 
But it was clear uh, when one would evaluate the situation that the best way to meet an unmet need in human medicine would be to have it used against river blindness, which is caused by yet another species of Onchocerca, Onchocerca volvulus. And that drug has been used to treat tens and tens of millions around the world. It's being used in Venezuela right now, a country that had a public health crisis imposed on it by the US. And it's keeping people alive, especially in the tropical and rural regions where, um, you know, because of uh, the brain drain and medical flight, a lot of clinics have ceased to exist. So this is a wondrous drug. The people who invented it are heroes. And I emailed them to ask if they had any comment about seeing their drug demonized as a horse dewormer, about seeing, you know, Representative Ilhan Omar complain that uh, prisoners who were being given ivermectin were being poisoned. And Campbell responded, uh, and he said that, you know, he's basically taken a vow of silence on this. He will not speak about it and he won't make a comment on whether it is effective for COVID-19 or not, which is really tragic. But we're seeing their work just denigrated and reduced to this pathetic little football in our trashy culture wars. Going back to the, uh, you know, the, the question of leftists supporting uh, or you know, kind of going along with, with the COVID narratives, um, you know, I wonder if there is a breaking point. I wonder if when, you know, you start seeing more and more Orwellian measures and you start, you know, facing the prospects of, you know, stuff like in Australia where they're building quarantine camps, like when things, uh, you know, start kind of going extremely off the rails in the real world and you can see the, the actual effects of that, I think that people will be able to rally around the flag a little bit and to, to kind of not support, not support those kind of measures, I, I would hope. I mean, right, like uh, Aaron Maté and Katie Halper, like they are civil libertarians. I think that they would be against those kinds of things happening. I mean, I, they're, they're good friends of mine, they're colleagues. I'm not going to say anything about them, but... You know, I think one of the dangers here for a lot of people who dug themselves in on social media and then they get attacked from one side or the other is that the, the tendency to double down. Um, and when I decided to be more public about with my views about this, I spent several weeks kind of meditating on it, researching as much as I could. I, I followed the same process I did before I kind of came out on Syria with my initial white helmets investigations in late 2016. And I wanted to be sure that I knew that where I stood was on, at least from my perspective on reality was on firm ground. And I hope that's where, that it, that's where everyone else was. But I, I mean, I previously had taken a really stupid and now embarrassing position on Syria. Uh, and I knew that it was full, filled with contradictions just weeks after taking it back in like 2012 or 2013. So people need to be humble enough to change their position when the consequences of the policies that they're tacitly supporting, which are big pharma's policies, uh, which are the policies of the security state, really come into effect and start changing their lives for, for good. Uh, if they are already doing great, grievous harm to working people in the US. Uh, the lockdowns have done serious harm to children. We have seen, I mean, the Globe and Mail in, in Toronto is now reporting that uh, a lot of senior deaths were not from COVID, but from neglect because of the lockdowns. So a lot of the reality, a lot of the truth is, is slowly coming out, but it's hard for a lot of people to admit it. And then there's just the fear factor. Uh, people are afraid. This is a little bit different than Russia Gate. It's different than the post 9-11 era, because I think a lot of people, even within the kind of Democratic Party and liberal circles, kind of knew that they weren't really, there wasn't really a serious threat of a terror attack. But now there's this virus that, you know, is potentially lethal, uh, particularly if you're, you know, you have a comorbidity, it's just lurking around every corner. And the fear porn is cranked up to 11. Yeah, it's a, it's a different kind of fear too, right? It's not like a fear of a terrorist doing something or Russia uh, shutting down yeah. the electrical grids. Like, like it's, it's a virus that you can actually catch. Yeah, I mean, Rachel Maddow didn't even believe herself when she said Russia was going to shut down the electrical grids. 
I think, you know, neither did Joy Reid. She didn't even know what she was talking about. No one really took it seriously. It was just like, let's get Trump and Putin's an authoritarian or whatever. It was like a lot of kind of liberal moral panic, but now it's real. And when people are confronted with death, no matter where they stand, if they are unable to reckon with their own mortality and accept it to some degree, they become more conservative and they accept more draconian pseudo solutions from the state. In this case, it's a state that we, you know, leftists are supposed to oppose because it represents imperialism and global capitalism. But, you know, you see this silence in the face of unprecedented new state powers being announced on national TV by Biden to govern the lives of working people. Well, just to play devil's advocate, um, you know, if it is really being pushed by capitalism, um, shouldn't the right, shouldn't these Trumpers, shouldn't conservatives be the ones enthusiastically in support of it? Why are we seeing, you know, a lot of conservatives pushing back against the vaccines? A lot of it is opportunism because a Democrat's president. I mean, you remember when Kamala Harris said she would never take a Trump vaccine and that, you know, we can't trust these vaccines because they're being pushed too quickly. Um, I think, you know, that explains a lot of the opposition from Fox News. The Christian right is a more powerful force than we uh, want to give it credit for being in the Republican Party because well, there are uh, there are a lot of parallels to the mark of the beast, I have to say, with all the uh, yes. vaccine passes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, I was called a conspiracist for a warning about vaccine passports. But, uh, you know, there are there's a lot of discussion on the right about um, you know, microchips being injected in people in order to check to, 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 to verify whether they are vaccinated or not. And, you know, 60 Minutes reported on a Pentagon DARPA program to do some version of that, but not to surveil people. But, you know, they can, they can read into all of this and see biblical illusions. There's also on the Christian right in opposition to vaccinations because um, some vaccines were produced using fetal parts. I don't even know if that's true, but that's a big part of their narrative. And then, you know, just the general get the hell, get the government out of my face, the government imposing uh, any measures on individuals. Uh, you know, the Second Amendment crowd is going to instantly oppose it. And then you have the right kind of taking a populist, I wouldn't call it anti-capitalist, but kind of you have these right wing pseudo populists or, you know, actual populists. I don't I mean, there, there are genuine populists on the right. They're not, you know, the Tom Cotton. I'm sorry, the uh, Josh Hawley's, but they understand where working America is especially white working people like Ted Cruz understands it, this Goldman, former Goldman Sachs banker. And he knows that they don't want these coercive policies. So he's always first to oppose, you know, vaccine mandates, uh, vaccine passports. He introduced a resolution in the Senate and the Democrats, uh, you know, it, it, honestly, you know, I'm thinking out loud and it's really difficult for me to completely understand exactly why the constituencies of the Republicans and Democrats are taking the stances they are. But it's very clear that both parties, if you look at the California recall, have found that COVID is a very convenient wedge issue for dividing people. They've transformed what should be a class narrative into a culture war. And it's, it's playing out very well for both sides. And you know, they love dividing people, uh, they, they're, whether it's Democrat or Republican, they're providing the perfect recipe for our real feudal masters who lord over both parties to get away with whatever they're doing. Looking within the constituency of the Democratic Party, you see a professional managerial class that's more inclined to reflexively trust scientists. And so you've seen Fauci kind of touted as this uh, kind of sage figure, even as he openly lies and admits to lying, says masks don't work, then says you have to mask up. His emails say masks don't work, mask mandates must be imposed. He says the 
herd immunity will come at 70% vaccination. Then he says that he lied about that and that we need to get to 90%. Now we need boosters. Two FDA officials resigned, say we don't need boosters. What the hell is going on here? Uh, but people just within the democratic base and like I live around them in DC. They have signs on their lawn thanking Fauci next to their signs uh, mourning the death of RBG. And they've created these secular saints out of figures that they identify with the educated technocracy that they participate in themselves. So for the, for the Republicans, they just typically, typically resent those kinds of people. Uh, Trump's base were males who didn't go to college. So they resent college educated people. And now you look at what's happening on campus. You see a generation being cultivated for obedience. 98% uh, vaccination rates at Yale or Brown University. And yet you have more restrictions being imposed on the students each week uh, because they're testing the hell out of them with PCR tests and coming out, coming up with asymptomatic tests left and right. Uh, and there's very little resistance on campus. So uh, we're talking about the culture and sensibility of the bases of two respective parties. And I think, you know, it says a lot. Um, and just finally, if you look at France, that kind of upends the right left paradigm in the US on COVID because a lot of leftists are participating in protests against uh, vaccine passports and do correctly see it as a permanent rollback of whatever's left of civil liberties there. And you have the yellow vest movement, which is sort of, uh, it's amorphous politically. It's hard to really place it. And they're at the forefront there. But there's nothing like that in the US right now. I think also in Scandinavia, right, like they lean very social democratic and I believe that they really haven't been embracing the vaccine in Scandinavia, right, or at least allowing some degree of freedom. Well, yeah, Sweden made a uh, sharply divergent policy move early on on COVID to try to avoid lockdowns and they got hammered in the international media for it and it did appear that their initial death rate was higher, uh, mainly the elderly dying, but children and the you know younger people did have it better. And now they're less restricted and their death rate has gone down. And Denmark, another Scandinavian country has effectively declared an end to the pandemic uh, and ended all emergency measures. What we see with Sweden, although, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it is kind of a, it's not the most independent state. I'm not trying to claim that. But they did appoint their own independent board to determine what policy is right for their population, whereas other countries are simply following the guidance of the World Health Organization, um, whose, I believe, second largest donor is Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates is involved at every level of the new normal and the quote unquote science. And those countries that have followed World Health Organization guidance are getting a kind of one size fits all policy and sacrificing their sovereignty to a organization that poses as a multilateral institution, but which really represents supranational imperialism. Well, Max, I know we're uh, coming up on an hour, which is longer than I said. Um, I don't know yeah. if maybe you, you had a little time left just to uh, run through some patron questions. Sure, sure. Patrons of Primo Radical for just $1 a month, they can submit questions directly to guests and also support the show, which is very helpful because many episodes get demonetized. I uh, highly suspect that this episode will probably be demonetized. Um, but I did have uh, I did have a few questions for you. Uh, lots of folks were excited about your appearance. Um, and the first question, I don't know if it may be a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, I think a lot of folks actually wonder about it. Uh, that's the subject of your father, um, who you know many... I know as being, you know, prominent in liberal establishment circles. Um, you know, I've always just kind of wondered too, like uh, Thanksgiving dinners and whatnot, do you guys have like uncomfortable political conversations or do you guys just like not talk about politics? Well, I, I would just ask everyone out watching right now, like, do you agree with your parents on everything? And if you do, like, what's, you're a young person, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, it, it, it's like, and then you have people whose parents like change the locks on them because they just have bad parents. But I was always encouraged to kind of question everything. We, we obviously, you know, part, part company on 
what the Democratic Party means. I mean, he really believes in the Democratic Party and defeating the Republicans. Um, and for me, I've, you know, I've, I've gone a different path, but um, it doesn't mean that uh, every Thanksgiving dinner is a, a food fight. And he also has a, a kind of a trajectory from alternative media. He was one of the, part of the first generation of alternative media post sixties reporters. Um, you know, he edited a book alongside Philip Agee, the CIA whistleblower uh, called Government by Gunplay on various assassinations. He wrote a chapter on the assassination of Fred Hampton. Uh, he was, a, you know, involved in the struggle in the 60s. So he, 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 gets, the, he gets what's going on what, on the left and what it is. Uh, but I think a lot of people in his generation became dismayed after the defeat of McGovern in the 70s, you know, the post-Vietnam era then seeing Reagan and Bush and just 12 years of Republican rule, the Reagan revolution is still with us. So I, I mean, I understand the mentality of that generation, but I became frustrated just seeing, uh, you know, decades of neoliberalism follow it, particularly the Obama era. And I think a lot of people watching this who are my age can identify with that. Um, he was also attacked harshly for defending my views on Palestine. Um, you know, a lot of the Clinton emails that came out showed him trying to, you know, advocate for a better policy when she was in the State Department on Israel-Palestine. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you're, you're talking about a complicated figure and I am too, um, but, you know, also just when it comes to a family, people, generally disagree with their parents on certain things. And if they don't, uh, they're not really evolving psychologically. And, you know, parents who don't accept that their children are going to do that, change the locks on them and cut them off are sort of terrible people. And I'm lucky to be in a, a different situation, <laughs> more flexible situation. So I had a question from Tim Penn. Tim writes, do you see a place for growing cooperation between parts of the left and libertarian circles beyond just anti-war goals? Aside from Scott Horton, are there any libertarians who you find common ground with? I think that, that right now, when you look at the full-scale attack on civil liberties in the new normal, which feel unprecedented, but at the, same time, at the same time represent this continuum from the post 9-11 era through the Russia Gate era to the present. Uh, you know, we need to work with whatever allies we can find within reason. Obviously, I'm not going to share a stage with a racist or a Nazi. I mean, obviously. Um, but when you look at the group of people who are speaking out against the new normal, it really is that same kind of 12 to 15% of the population that doesn't trust the government within Western societies. And within that group, the views are more heterogeneous than those of the 30% that forms the kind of COVIDian cult around Fauci and accepts the prevalent official narrative as the holy gospel. They tend to be more similar. And so that is how we get broken down and constantly steamrolled. Lead, you know, libertarians are going to be more annoyed by what's happening right now than a lot of leftists reflexively are. And I don't know what working with them entails, but you know, the other day Scott Horton actually called me up and said, "There's an anti-war rally downtown, like ten minutes from where you live. Come down here and uh, you know, speak to it." So I, I really wasn't that well aware of who was planning the rally or who was going to be there. And I just walked up there. They handed me a megaphone. And I said, you know, I talked about how 9-11 set the stage for all these regime change wars, seven countries being destroyed in five years, and how hard it was after 9-11, actually, to reach people, um, including in certain sectors of the left. Uh, people, a lot of people just wanted to liberate Afghanistan and thought we were going to save these women. And, 
you know, even protesting the Iraq war, it was an unpopular cause in 2003. So now we have an unpopular cause and we need to stand together and try to grow. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what I said there. And I got attacked because there were a lot of libertarians in the crowd. I, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. I mean, it was an anti-war rally. They were chanting, you know, fuck the CIA and fuck the FBI walking through the streets of DC. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, but you know, that's, I think we need more of that. And it really depends on what you mean by, by working together. But we definitely, uh, you know, need people thinking together and collaborating on how to encourage others to see what's staring us in the face. And then beyond the, you know, beyond the new normal and all that stuff, the, the other crisis that's staring us in the face is just massive, massive death and inequality. I mean, I just walk out of my house and see people stumbling around on heroin, uh, homelessness in Washington, D.C., like I've never seen before. Uh, you know, tent encampments are popping up under every bridge. A woman who I would regularly see under a bridge not far from my house died of exposure last winter. And this is barely even discussed. So, Whoever wants to take on this system, you know, it, it, it does. I don't. The labels are increasingly meaningless to me. Uh, yeah. Funnily enough, I actually had another question uh, about libertarians. It's kind of open ended, so answer it however you'd like. It says, "Is Trump actually a libertarian, and does that mean paying no taxes for public programs?" Well, Trump to me was just like a Republican who had. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I can answer this question in a, in a short. I don't know if I can. Short <laughs> sound bite. Uh, but just generally, Trump to me, he aligned himself with the Republican Party. And when he fell under criminal investigation during Russiagate, he gave them one of the biggest tax cuts in history. And that provided him with the protection he needed within Congress against the investigation because you had all. And libertarians, although they adopt a lot of libertarian precepts of just for the market is going to solve everything. Uh, they're all going to go work for the Koch brothers and go lobby for corporations after, you know, two or four years in Congress. They're just there to line up those jobs. And so Trump gave them what they needed to protect his ass. And he was like, you know, thinking like a mob boss. So it doesn't really matter to me what Trump actually believed um, and what Trump actually said he was going to do when he came into office was pretty well rolled back by all of the forces of the permanent bureaucracy that really determines the agenda of those in power in the U.S. Uh the next one's kind of like a long meandering question. Um, I was actually a little <laughs> confused by it. I uh, one thing I guess I didn't know, did Donald Trump retweet you at one point in time? Yeah, he did. And you changed your Twitter handle? Yeah. What did you change it to? Well, I just thought if I'm on the president's timeline, I could change my Twitter name to any slogan that I want to promote, which would seem really dissident and it would be kind of like a performance piece. So, you know, I wrote free Gaza, prosecute Pompeo or um, indict Pompeo. Uh, fire Jared Kushner, you know, defund the police, just all, all of the things that I think Trump actually would have agreed with uh, some of them, like firing Jared Kushner, um, definitely not defunding the police. But within eight hours or so, he unretweeted me. And, you know, my tweet was, it was one of my best tweets. I mean, I just said, John Bolton is an enemy of humanity. He's one of the worst people on the planet. And the liberals are embracing him. And any piece of Cold War hysteria he echoes, if it's framed as, you know, an anti-Trump talking point, then liberals will fall for it. And someone told Trump, like, here's this guy, Max Blumenthal on the left. Uh, he's he's attacking Bolton. And it seems like he's defending you, even though I, I wasn't. Uh, so he retweeted me opportunistically. And like, it, to me, it was just funny. But like Israeli media had a field day because they hate me there. They were like Trump retweets anti-Semite Max Blumenthal. They had the Jewish Telegraphic Agency had 
a reporter write two or three articles about Trump's retweet. They were like the Max Blumenthal retweet correspondent. So it was just a, it was a hilarious episode and we'll never experience anything like that again because someone like Trump won't be in the White House. And that's, you know, another reason why his Twitter account was banned because mm. it's just, it's just too wild, too difficult to control. So you don't think that there's any chance of him getting back in in 24? I don't want to make any prediction. I mean, I mean, I, can I, see. I, I have a hard time seeing it just because if he is like completely banned off of everything, I mean, I guess it comes down to how controlled uh, is the general consensus really by big tech and corporate media? I think pretty thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, you know, it seems to me, especially like in, in light of, uh, you know, the consensus on COVID at least. Um, but I don't know. I, I guess it's possible when you have somebody who's very charismatic that he breaks through with other apps or I don't know, just big, huge stadium events or something. But it's it's hard to see. It. It's hard to see it happening, especially because, you know, Twitter and, and Facebook is really what drove his success uh, in 2016. And really like that's been the motivation to stamp that out. Right. To control uh, yeah. the digital commons just because the the way that Trump was able to effectively utilize it in 2016. I mean, there's so many factors. Who are the Democrats going to run? <laughs> I don't, the, I mean, the, it, I strongly question whether Biden will be able to run again. Kamala Harris, she's really unpopular. Mm -hmm. She won less delegates than Tulsi Gabbard. Let's remember that. Uh, her support from Black Americans was rock bottom when she was running. So, and, and her approval rating right now is I think pretty low. She's hiding. So who, who is gonna run, who would run against a, a Trump if he got the nomination? Trump just had a huge rally in Alabama. Then he was on that bizarre DraftKings special where Evander Holyfield got beaten down by like 57 year old Evander Holyfield got beaten down by 44 year old Vitor Belfort and Trump was doing color commentary with Don Jr. next to him and a bunch of former UFC fighters. I mean, that's kind of what he's been reduced to, but the, if you watched it, the entire stadium was just chanting for Trump. And it was a giant Trump rally. So he does, he does still command this grassroots base in a way no other Republican does. And at the very least, all of these DeSantis and Pompeo characters are going to be vying for Trump's endorsement and Trump is the kingmaker. It doesn't matter how much he's banned. Uh, and I think the 20, the California recall is kind of a preview of the 2024 election. It's gonna be a referendum on a lot of these coercive COVID policies, except that California's electorate looks nothing like the entire country uh, where the Republicans can only win these kind of rural inland districts and they nominate someone who has no chance of winning Larry Elder who lumps in COVID with every other possible culture war wedge issue to winnow out the Republican base as much as possible. Um, it, it's it's gonna be, and you, you're, you're right. I mean, it's gonna be one of the most controlled elections we've ever seen. I think January 6th is a huge factor too in the, the need to control the election, to control I mean that, the Well, that's gonna be like every Democratic uh, campaign commercial, right? It's just like footage of January 6th. Yeah, and you know they killed all the cops and things like that for sure. They 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 were on to kill AOC and um, it would be very effective in suburban swing districts where they want like the soccer mom vote. Well, uh, last question for you, Max. It's uh, how hard is it to found and run a reader supported organization like the Gray Zone? How do you keep the lights on? It's hard, but it's also what makes it easy is, you know, people like you and your audience that's watching now, the support has just been incredible. Uh, and it's, it's what we get, I think, what the reward we get for filling a void that was left by progressive media, which effectively collapsed in the Trump era and being able to, being willing to say what a lot of people on the left and people in general, I mean, our audience isn't completely limited to the left and it's an international audience What people just are experiencing. Uh, it's not just, you know, corporate legacy media that's failed the American and Western public. It's also so-called progressive media like The Nation, 
uh, like whatever alternate became like, uh, you know, truth dig got rid of Bob Shear and Chris Hedges. I don't even know what it is anymore. The real news, which was this incredible institution funded, founded by Paul Jay. Uh, democracy now. Democracy now. Exactly. I mean, they've, uh, democracy now is the perfect example because it's still standing and it's still being funded those other institutions are like shells uh, maybe not the nation but yeah i mean so we filled a serious void and people supported us in an enthusiastic way and that's made it just an ins the most inspiring experience for me in in like 20 years of journalism how hard is it well i have colleagues who are really adept uh, ben Norton is like a Swiss army knife. He can do so much uh, technically as a video editor, as a writer. And, you know, Aaron Mate and Anya are pumping out video content. And so they lit up our YouTube channel. And we have a really cool editor who's a friend from the real news days. And my job is to basically, in addition to doing investigative reporting, which I think is the hardest part, just finding time to do an investigative piece. When I do one, you have to really go down the rabbit hole and you can't really function on a normal level. You have to basically be sitting in a room for at least a week writing it, in addition to gathering all the research and doing the reporting. So that part's the most difficult for me. And then editing everyone and kind of being a curator, uh, going out and finding and cultivating writers and then doing you know our moderate rebels podcast as well and i just launched another kind of podcast it's a live stream every week at rockfin called foreign agents rockfin's kind of given me a sanctuary from youtube i don't have to deal with the demonetization and the censorship so it's more free form there but you know all of these things kind of take away from what i value the most which is investigative reporting and writing and fundamentally i'm a writer the most fulfilling thing for me to do is to write books. Um, and I think books are one of the most powerful uh, vehicles for educating or radicalizing people. And, you know, the, it, being taken away from writing by running this operation or, or, or to, to, not being to not be taken away from writing by running this operation is the, the biggest challenge for me. Um, and, you know, at the same time, uh, it's you know if if your if your questioner is looking to launch an independent website news site, my advice is just do news. You know that's what will set you apart. Like do real reporting, make phone calls, go out in the field, and do the do the work uh, because there's already enough punditry out there, and it's very hard to break through with it. And there's very few journalists. There's very few legitimate journalists. Uh, one story that I broke on this show was uh, when Mike Gravel uh, was co-endorsing both Bernie Sanders and uh, Tulsi Gabbard. And his uh, campaign, for their own reasons, were misrepresenting him and saying that he was just endorsing Bernie Sanders. And it seemed as though there was no journalist in the world who actually wanted to call Mike Gravel and talk to him about it. <laughs> so yeah. I did and found out that it was a co-endorsement. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, they're, they're just trying to actually uh, speak to people and break news. There's not many journalists actually doing that. There's a lot of people just kind of transcribing what happens on Twitter. Um, yeah, so. exactly. And then you wind up becoming kind of a force multiplier for corporate media because you're just linking to them and relying on their accounts. And it's, it, it isn't that hard to pick up the phone. I think it's just a question of having the time to do it. Well, Max, I really do appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Sorry to uh, to run over longer than uh, I said we would. But uh, for folks out there who would like to follow you and support you, how can they do that? Well, we ran over because it was a great discussion. So, and, and I'm a big fan of the show. Thank so you. Thanks a lot for having me. And um, Max Blumenthal on Twitter, thegrayzone.com. That's gray with an A. And uh, Moderate Rebels, we're on YouTube. Check out our Gray Zone YouTube channel. We have new content almost every day there. And I have a show at Rockfin uh, called Foreign Agents. It's for subscribers, but if you subscribe, you get access to all content on Rockfin, which is constantly growing. And because YouTube just sucks so hard and is so censorious, I think places like Rockfin really represent the 
future for political content creators and journalists. Max, thanks again for being on the show and hope I can have you back at some point in the future. Absolutely, I really appreciate it.